Tack, Kjörre Kajtaj. Kjörre. Inga rangatira. Tina Korua. Nu är jag här. Jag är 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 här. So greetings and welcome everyone. Um, welcome especially to, to our guests today, our speakers. And um, I have thanked them or, uh, for bringing their deep knowledge into our, into our midst. And greeting to, to everyone else, um, to, to the rest of us. It's really nice to be back in um, space together. Um, we've sort of eschewed doing uh, online Zooms because of the kind of uh, the, the sort of uh, types of, of work everyone's doing, the kind of Zoom fatigue, um, but it's cool to be back here, um, able to, to critically engage together again. So I'll hand um, straight over. We don't have heaps of time. We'll stop about 5-2. Um, oh, we will stop earlier than that for, for questions, um, but I'll hand over now to Marama and Kiri. Kiri. <laughs> <laughs> Tua tahi kamihi ki tō tātou kaihanga mō ngā mana ki tanga ki runga i tō tātou hui. E mihi ana ki a koutou, ngā mana, ngā reo, ngā pūkenga, me ngā kārangaranga maha nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. A tēnā koe e hoa, uh, thank you for the invitation to speak today and um, thank you all for coming. This is Kerry and I's first time together as a yeah. duo, <laughs> uh, in person. <laughs> we haven't practised so we've got... Um, I hope our timing is okay. I hope that we are great. <laughs> but I'll rip into it. Um, so our title is Back to the Flax Roots, looking at Kaitiakitanga in context. So um, last year our slide. Yeah. Last year our new research team were awarded a Te Aparangi Marsden grant to conduct a study focused on listening to the kaitiaki voices of harbours. We designed an interdisciplinary project that includes investigators from anthropology, history, law and Māori community researchers. A doctoral student, Ngahuia Harrison, and an MA student, Charmaine Tukiri, have also been recruited to the project. Ngahuia Whakapapas to the Whangarei Harbour and Charmaine to the Kafia Harbour. Our project will trial new Māori methods in interdisciplinary and community-centred research. While the project has roots in anthropology and history, it does not reside solely within these disciplines. Mai Hawaiki nui ki whangaparaua, huri ki tāmaki, ki whangarei, ka huki anō ki tāmaki, whitiatu ki te manukanuka o Hotiroa, ka haere ki mōkau, ka taka te punga, Ka huki aki ki kāwhia kai kāwhia tangata kāwhia moana. Katu ko hani rawa ko puna. This kōrero hikoi, wordsmithed by my father who passed away four weeks ago, so I have to say that. He wrote this with us. Um, he wrote the, the Topara para for our project when we decided that we would do it. I just want to acknowledge my dad. Um, traces the harbour routes travelled by the Tainui Waka which is said to have been guided into the Kafia Harbour Peninsula by Pana Ira Ira, a Tanifa creature, and Kaitiaki. The English translation for the Tauparapara is from Hawaiki to Whangaparawa, then to Tāmaki, then to Whangarei, and returning to Tāmaki, crossing over to the Manuka Harbour, continuing on to Moko, turning to Kafia, Kafia the waters, Kafia the sustenance, Kafia the people, the resting place of Hani and Puna, the Taurapa and Tauihu of the Tainui Canoe. Our research focuses on kaitiakitanga and on harbours, stemming from the intersection of these in the Manukau Harbour claim, led by Dame Nani Korman Hinnick, which was central to kaitiaki becoming a central kaitiakitanga, becoming a central concept in law and policy. We will investigate kaitiakitanga as an ethic and flax root politic emphasising the work of community activists at multiple levels, from the shores and waters of their harbours to the steps of Parliament. The word kaitiakitanga was mobilised by Māori rights activists in the 1980s in strategic campaigns to defend their lands and waters from environmental desecration. 
The inclusion of kaitiakitanga in legislation and policy developed in the, con in the context of increasing neoliberal and third way politics, where the government sought to devolve many of its responsibilities to stakeholders. Central and local government tend to use the term kaitiaki as a convenient Māori shorthand for stakeholder, recognising Māori interests and requesting their labour without relinquishing power or offering reward. This project will provide a fuller description of kaitiakitanga, including its evolution since the 1980s and the impact of law and policy on its practice today. Our first aim, or our aim is, sorry, our aim is to focus on the critically important and threatened environments of harbours. When the first voyagers arrived in Aotearoa, they sought whānga, sheltered bays in which to draw up their waka and come into land. Hundreds of years later, the first Europeans did the same. Aotearoa's harbours are, and always have been, coveted and contested sites for navigation, industry, fishing, recreation and settlement. Historically, they are important places of meeting, negotiation and exchange. They are where land and sea and people come together. Yet, there has never been a comprehensive study of harbours and their significance to New Zealand or to Māori. Most written histories of individual harbours, if they mention Māori history at all, sail over it swiftly and shallowly before moving on to a narrative about Pākehā industry. So what are the stories Māori tell about their harbours and their relationships with harbours? How do kaitiaki understand these places and how to, be, and how to best care how to best use and care for them. This project arose from conversations with Flax Roots Māori. It actually came into being in the Hop and Stop Cafe at Topiri. Uh, when I was telling a cousin, Shane Solomon, oops, no, he's there, Shane, um, that Kerry and I were planning to submit a mask and application to investigate the latest freshwater issues for New Zealand rivers. He responded with, haven't our rivers already been done to death? You've already done the book. I responded with, well, what do you think we should do then? And he said, you're on your way to Raglan. What about harbours? That would be more orig original and relevant. <laughs> and I said, I don't have a team for a harbours project. And he said, look around the table. And at the table was my husband, Gerald, who's over there, he's in the photo, and Shane and me, and Kerry was going on a walk somewhere. So that was the team, and that was how we <laughs> developed our amazing team uh, at Topiri in the Hop and Stop Cafe, just had an epiphany. Mm -hmm. And so the Harbours Project was born. Now despite the prevalence of kaitiakitanga kōrero in the literature, the voices of those with daily responsibility for it are seldom heard. Our case study approach, building from our established relationships with Māori communities in Waikato and Taitokiro, is necessary to explore the diverse local expressions of kaitiaki tanga. Through our collaborations with tangata whenua from the harbours, we will investigate ways in which mātauranga Māori and kaitiaki tanga, and related terms, interact with local and central government ways of knowing and treating the environment. We will explore kaitiaki tanga as a political movement, and a network of concepts and relationships varying between places and communities and changing over time. We will listen to and gather stories of the Kafia, Manuko and Whangarei harbours. These harbours cover a representative range of ecological states and threats, economic uses and inter-iwi relationships. This project is not a comparative study but an in-depth study of kaitiakitanga over harbours based on detailed case-studied analysis. The three sites will be put in national context by analysing documentary resources on kaitiaki across the motu. Our project builds on and broadens an important precedent set by Mira Takafaru in her PhD, 1998 PhD thesis on kaitiakitanga and subsequent publications, as well as work undertaken by Māori Marsden, Nani Komen Hinnik, Margaret Motu, Angeline Greensill, Jacinta Ruru and others. Our focus on harbours allows us to look at dynamics of land and sea, kaitiakitanga, as well as the multiple human relationships that are drawn through harbours. 
the narrow bureaucratic space in which central and local, local government allow for kaitiaki tanga often hinders its full exercise and fails to create for the wider obligations, rights and spiritual dimensions that are fundamental to it. The first kaitiaki were atua, tanifa and other natural, natural phenomena. Local meanings of taiki kaitiakitanga come from its interplay with other Māori, other Māori concepts such as Māori, Rahui, or Māori means sort of like the life force, the Rahui, the prohibitions, Tanifa, you know what a Tanifa is, Mātauranga, Māori knowledge, Rangatiratanga, leadership, and mana, authority, Kotahitanga, unity, um, Whanaungatanga, and Whakapapa. Our study recognises that these terms are interpreted and practised differently by different iwi, hapu, whānau and marae. We seek to learn how people have enacted kaitiakitanga in their daily lives in continuation of tradition and response to environmental degradation and appropriation. Kaitiakitanga today takes various forms, from upholding tikanga in interactions with the environment and passing knowledge on to future generations, to political work in conversation and contest with the state, such as letter writing, submission writing, legal action and protest. Our study will go beyond the dominant voices of tribal spokespeople who are, give, who are given preference by the Crown, Government and iwi authorities. We are committed to including the full range of community voices, including the kōrero of kaumātua, rangatahi or kaumātua elders, rangatahi are the youth, and particularly wahine Māori. Women's leadership is particularly important, is, women's leadership is especially important, oops, that's Whangarei Harbour by the way, there they are. Women's leadership is especially important as it is underrepresented in the existing literature. Strong Māori women such as Nāne Ko Minhinik, Tua, um, Eva Rickard, Angeline Greensill, Carmen Kirkwood, Dale Takitimu, Pania Newton and others less well known have played a fundamental role in the activation of kaitiakitanga in relation to harbours. Furthermore, there is a rich history of tupuna wahine associated with harbours, including Whakaotirangi at Kafia, who was Hoturo's first wife, she was on the Tainui canoe, um, Puihuia and Tiatai i Rehua, Rehia at Manuko, and Kuawai, Reitu and Reipai at Whangarei. So those are all um, Māori ancestors, tūpuna ancestors that are in our history, in our oral traditions. that all lived by the sea. Now we say that the time for this research is now. Harbours are under accelerating environmental pressure and Māori communities living in har on harbours are increasingly affected by climate change by climate change. Harbours around the country are the subject of multiple claims under the Marine Coastal Area Act, Takutai Moana, and Waitangi, Waitangi claim, tribal tribunal claims over harbours are yet to be settled and are at the forefront of the next wave of treaty settlements. This project will reveal for the first time the complex and diverse relationships that Māori have with local harbours. Our research seeks to demonstrate that the wholeness of kaitiakitanga can only be fully understood when, when applied in context with other Māori concepts used by tangata whenua in specific places. The study reclaims the political nature of kaitiakitanga and the work of women and men who have fought to protect the environment and to be recognised as kaitiaki. I hand over to my colleague. <laughs> A tuatahi ko ai tēnei, uh, he Pākehā, nō ko te rani tōku whaea, nō ingarangi ngā tūpuna o tōku matua, i hare mai rātou ki ngā motu i te rautou te kauma iwa, i, a i tipu ake a hau i te whanganui a tāra i raro i te maru o tarikākā. He honore mōku ki te kōrero ki a koutou i te taho o tōku tūkana, nō reira tēnā koutou katoa. So Maram has introduced our project. Um, so we had intended to do, have done what, two wānanga by now maybe? At least one. Two. Two, yeah. yeah. But because of COVID, our kind of data collection part has really been yeah, sold. And my dad's tangihanga. And, and the tangihanga, yeah. yeah. There's been a lot of stuff going on this year. Yeah. Um, so what we have managed to do so far is to get into the archives a little bit. So my part of the corridor is going to be talking about sort of some of the stuff we've discovered in, in some early archival research. 
So we're looking at kaitiakitanga. Uh, this has always been a word in te reo Māori, but it hasn't always been used in the way that it's used today to kind of designate Māori resource management, if you like. So what kaitiakitanga now describes, the system of relationships and customs between Māori and the natural environment, has always existed in te ao Māori, but there wasn't originally a separate word for it because the natural environment wasn't really seen as a separate thing that, to relate to. So kaitiakitanga was simply part of tikanga, a completely integrated part of the parcel of customs and laws that govern human action in the world. Or as the Law Commission put it more elegantly in 2001, kaitiakitanga is a term coined in relatively recent times to give explicit expression to an idea which was implicit in Māori thinking but which Māori had hitherto taken for granted. So I'm a Pākehā historian, so all the pretty slides are over until Marama talks again. I'm just going to get quotes <laughs> on a white screen. Sorry, guys. Um, so I'm going to describe how this use of kaitiaki and kaitiakitanga to refer to Māori resource management practices evolved in the 1980s and early 1990s, <clears throat> especially looking at the Manukau Harbour claim, which Marama has always already mentioned, led by Ngāne Kōman Hinnik of Ngāti Te Ata. Um, and looking also at the early government attempts to uh, implement the findings of the tribunal report, which was the archival work. So we're looking at how this concept and the politics associated with it evolved. This is important because it's a really interesting example of Māori responding politically to the problems they face as part of ongoing colonisation. In this context, the pollution of their traditional lands and waters and the food resources associated with them. This was a topic of a lot of the early Waitangi Tribunal claims before the historical, the ability to look back historically. Um, and it shows the kind of really narrow institutional spaces that they had in which to challenge the thing, the, this pollution going on. Um, so the development of kaitiakitanga as a political ethic shows Māori attempting to kind of force open the narrow spaces to create the possibility for tikanga to thrive. They're taking advantage of a moment in New Zealand history where there was a, a sort of um, more democratisation of management, so opportunities for citizens to take part in environmental management. And, and kaitiakitanga has been really strategically used to create a space for Māori within that emerging institutional space. And it shows the ongoing difficulties they faced in doing this. So, for example, getting kaitiakitanga inscribed in the Resource Management Act was a real win. But then the space that that created, again, faces continual encroachment from Pākehā ways of thinking and the Pākehā institutions of law and policy that ultimately govern that space. So um, there's really early pushback to kind of the, um, yeah, the spaces that are opening for kaitiakitanga. You can see... Māori saying, well, this isn't exactly what we meant. <laughs> can, we, can we make it a bit bigger here? But let's start with the kupu itself. So tiaki is the root word here. So it means to care for, tend, protect and guard. Um, kai in front of a word often designates an actor and tanga or anga or hanga at the end is a nominalising suffix which basically captures a bit of, a, bit of context. So noho is to sit, noho anga is a seat. Um, Ako is to teach and learn, Kayako is a teacher, so there kaitiakitanga is the the kind of context of human caring for things, it's not necessarily the environment. Um, and there are 19th century and early 20th century text examples of kaitiaki and kai, uh, not so much kaitiakitanga but kaitiaki being used in the way that it's predominantly used today for human protectors of the environment. Um, but this use seems to be fairly rare and interestingly to be more prominent from around the 1870s onwards, which is the time when the New Zealand government started to take more seriously the um, environmental destruction of particularly the forests and take some action to protect them. So again, you can kind of see it uh, responding to what's happening in, in New Zealand history. So... This example, so most of these examples are um, taken from Te Mata Puninga, which is an amazing kind of compendium of um, terms that have uh, in Māori traditional law. Uh, this example is um, from an 1874 uh, magazine, Te Waka Māori, and it's specifically referring to a bill that's under progress under the Vogel government to preserve forests. E whakatika rawa ana au ki taua mahi tiaki ngā herehere, 
Nā mātou tau a tikanga no mua mai anō no o mātou tūpuna a tainoa mai ki tēnei takiwā. So mahi tiaki, um, the work of protecting ngā herehere forests. Um, so you can see that use of tiaki in this particular context. <coughs> this example is, a, is an interesting one, a really early one of protecting guardians, which I'm going to be talking about in the 1970s in, in a minute. Um, a meeting being held to appoint Renata Kawepo Arihi Tenahu Watene Kapuku and Renata Pukutsutu as kaitiaki or guardians of a lake. Mm-hmm. It's not a perfect translation here, but gets the gist. Let no one take them unless these guardians say the word. And another meeting here where um, mana tiaki, so the mana to protect. Uh, is set over some bird snaring areas. So in the last two examples you can really see how much this kupu is being used to not just talk about protection but also the right to protect that how much kind of mana and rangatiratanga is involved in the idea like if you have if, if it's your responsibility to care for these resources it's also your authority to have that responsibility and no one else's and you have the right to let no one else take fish from the lake or no one else take um, birds from this area. Uh, so, oh, sorry, just before I go to that one, um, Te Mata Puninga also notes a use of manakitanga as a translation for care and management of pātuna or tuna gathering places. So that also shows that it's not always um, tiaki or kaitiakitanga that's being used to describe this sort of idea. Um, Another predominant old use of the word kaitiaki is for the non-human protectors of humans and of the environment, and also of taonga. So here's an example. Ko ngā tipua kaiwaho o te, o te uruti he kaitiaki no te, no te tātai kaura no ko, tua, ko tūrua hine he wahine he, tupua, he tupuna no ngai te ao ko o tō uri. So tipua, which are these kind of spiritual beings, um, are guardians that descend from crayfish, mm. um, and, and, and showing that whakapapa connection as well, um, which is another part of kaitiaki, that's such a fundamental part of kaitiaki tanga that doesn't often get recognised in the way that Pākehā talk about it today. Mm. So... Oh, and another really interesting example, again, of these um, non-human protectors of people in the environment is a, a, a Te Mata Puninga um, notes Eric Schwimmer's JPS article on Guardian Animals of the Māori, which is based in Ngātiwai, which is uh, an iwi that the Jane Tenare Centre works with a lot, that they use the word mana to talk about these um, creatures, often sea creatures, that protect the environment and the people in the area. And I did some papers past work myself, like, I don't know if you guys know papers past, it's an amazing resource even for non-historians, I think, Nick Grinning. <laughs> it's an online repository of digital newspapers, um, Māori language and English language newspapers, um, just like so much information and it's all fully searchable. And you can see when you look for kaitiaki in these resources that it's always done a lot of work as a term for translating Pākehā legal concepts, especially the term trustee. So, for example, the public trustee was translated as kaitiaki mō te katoa, or kaitiaki for everyone. Um, te Mata Puninga says in their description of kaitiaki tanga that in modern usage the word has come to encapsulate an emerging ethic of guardianship or trusteeship, especially over natural resources. So they talk about how it's come to, they acknowledge that it's a fairly new use of the word. And Te Mata Puninga jumps from a 1963 JPS article up to the uh, appearance of the term kaitiakitanga in the Resource Management Act 1991. And what we're doing um, in our project and in this paper is looking at the key period in between these two dates where this modern meaning of the word evolves. So we started with the Manukau Harbour claim, knowing that Ngāne Kōmin Hinnik, later Dame Ngāne Kōmin Hinnik, had been a really key figure in the development of ideas about kaitiakitanga. So we read the report and the submissions to it and went into the archives to look at the documents around the implementation. 
And we found some interesting things. Firstly, that the idea for kaitiaki of the Manukau Harbour, which was one of the recommendations of the tribunal that kaitiaki be established to care for the harbour, seems to have been fairly directly inspired by the already existing institution of lake guardians. So the first lake guardians were established in 1973 over Lake Manapodi. So there'd been um, a really huge environmental battle over this lake um, because there was a proposal to substantially raise its levels for hydroelectric purposes in the 60s um, and the 70s. So just massive environmental battles over it. The Save Manapodi campaign was probably like the biggest early environmental campaign in New Zealand history. And the Labour Party went into the 1972 election, led by Norman Kirk, with this in their manifesto. So I don't know where the idea comes from, but that's my next archives trip to try and figure out where the idea of guardians comes from. Um, but they, they went in promising to appoint regional guardians to protect reserves, parks, domains, kind of communal spaces. And then when they came in in 1972, they established guardians, a body of six guardians, over Lake Manapodi, and they were drawn from the campaigners for the Safe Manapodi campaign, which was quite innovative at the time to take um, people who had been sort of fighting against the government, if you like, and put them in position of power, um, advising at least. But they did; they had um, they could commission research and they could demand information from the government. So they, while being an advisory body, they did have quite a lot of power. They were all men. They were chosen for their scientific and engineering expertise and they were mainly advising the government on keeping the lake levels steady for the lake's health during the operation of the hydroelectric scheme. Um, and there doesn't seem to have been any discussion in the archives that I can see about including a Ngaitahu member. The Lake Wanaka Guardians followed in 1974. Their responsibilities were to advise on keeping control of, duck, of lake weed and initiating research into a really gross sounding problem. I don't know what it is exactly called, duck itch, which apparently <laughs> affected swimmers in Lake Wanaka. <laughs> And then the third body in existence at the time of the Manukau inquiry were the guardians of the Rotorua lakes. So in the archives you can see um, going into the 1980s from being like bodies of all male kind of scientific experts they start to at least start thinking we should include some women here um, and you know that's definitely kind of deliberately being done but there's not, there's, I really can't see at the moment any discussion about Māori inclusion. But then in 1983, the Minister for the Environment asked for a commission for the environment. So the commission was a kind of slightly arm's length body that had been established by that same Kirk government to sort of advise on environmental issues. Um, and the commissioner, Ken Piddington, who is the son of Ralph Piddington, Marama was giving me a little bit of history before, and he obviously like, has a, quite a bit of understanding about Māori culture and interest. Um, so he he's uses a few Māori kupu in his description of what the trustees are that they should be citizens of standing in the local community, i.e. they should have mana, they should be detached from resource management functions and have a clear role as trustees, they should be able to operate on a minimum budget and represent a range of interests and philosophies of resource use. And that kind of range of interests thing does seem eventually to bring in Māori cultural interests, but it's not explicitly mentioned here. Um, I do want to draw your attention to point three. Um, this is something we're looking at in our project as well. Like, it's the kind of dark flip so side of the coin of more citizen engagement in um, the management of resources is that it's supposed to be done on the those citizens' own time. Mm -hmm. And you can definitely see Māori struggling with the same thing when the space opens for Kaitiaki Tanya. Like, you do, you're doing this out of love, right? <laughs> Um, it's a way of kind of cheaply devolving responsibilities to willing um, people in the community. Um, he, does, he also mentions in this memo that the Guardian's idea was floated with Isla Taylor and other claimants from the Motunui Waitara claim, which is one of the very earliest um, Waitangi tribunal claims, but the idea didn't come to fruition. But it rose again in a very in a fruitful-ish way <laughs> in the Manukau claim. So Ngāni Kumin Hinnick brought the Manukau claim to the Waitangi Tribunal on behalf of Ngāti Te Ata, who, her hapu, and Waikato Tainui more generally. In the words of the Tribunal, it was a wide-ranging claim, essentially about the pollution of the harbour, undergirded by a kind of massive historical trauma, which 
So the Manukau report was actually really instrumental in getting the um, clause passed that allowed the tribunal to look at historical issues because it became just so clear that you couldn't really understand what this claim was about without being able to look at the history. And the tribunal, in fact, did look at the history, but it couldn't really recommend on it until 1985. So the claimants sought ownership and management of the Manukau bed. All further water rights applications be suspended until a judgment had been made on the treaty rights of Waikato Tainui and that legislation be amended to recognise and protect Māori perspectives on water conservation. So these are kind of like very big political goals here. In and, and this, this case, as with many, we're done? Okay. Um, <laughs> was kind of a last result after years and years of campaigning by Ngāni Kōman Hinnock. Um, so it was sort of like the final stop when she'd been sort of disrespected bringing her issues and concerns forth at all of these planning tribunal hearings and stuff. Not until you get to the tribunal that she really gets heard. Um, and she's definitely using kaitiaki in, in both her submissions to the tribunal but also to earlier um, submissions for the non-human in the non-human way, te roa kaifare, the tanifa of the Manukau Harbour, and, and using it also for the people. Um, and then in the claim itself, Sir Robert Mahuta um, like specifically references the guardians of, of the Manapodi Lakes and recommends that they be established again over the Manukau Harbour, which the tribunal eventually recommends. Um, I can't see whether they were actually ever created, but Kaitiakitanga takes on a real life from this moment on. Um, and um, Māori Marsden is actually, he writes the, his famous paper on Kaitiakitanga in order to help the um, development of the resource management process. So, it, and, and then it becomes eventually put in the RMA. Uh, the first, the 1991 definition was um, roundly criticised for not being kind of comprehensive enough um, and so they brought in a new one in 1997 but you'll see that neither of them really mentioned Tino Ranga Tiratanga um, you know it's all about this kind of ethic of stewardship although the second one at least does kind of mention that wider context of tikanga. so just before I hand back I just wanted to say that like you can see in this Māori strategically claiming a place for Māori ways of caring for the environment in this opening space for citizen citizen caring for the environment. However, in engaging with Pākehā ideas in this way, there are always traps for Māori. In maintaining the boundaries of any new institutional space that opens up is a challenge. And you can see this really on in the archives where um, Ngāti Te Ata start to push back against the idea of the Guardians because... It's, it's overwhelming, it's subsuming any debate about the handback of the harbour. So they're saying, like, tai hoa on this Guardian's concept, which we like, but first let's talk about the ownership of the harbour. But of course, you know, you can see that Guardian's it has precedent, it's a concept that Pakia understand and are ready to implement, and they want to push forward with that one uh, at the expense of the kind of more, the bigger political issues. <laughs> Another pretty slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I am now going to talk to you about how we do this. What are our methods? Why are we different to other research um, projects that deal with the environment? So, Teopira McDowell presents the marae as a metaphor for research design, offering an indigenous counter-narrative to the way that we think about conducting research. He argues that academics should play the role of ringawera, or kitchen workers in research doing the background study, legal work or leg work and organising while participants call it all or talk. He suggests that while professional researchers have the right to speak, communities remain equally, if not more important, in the analysis of their own experiences. Our project privileges the voices of Flax Roots Māori and will foreground their narratives using kaupapa and tikanga methods. Our research design integrates qualitative approaches from anthropology such as multi-sided ethnography, thick description and discourse analysis. Our approach advances current anthropological scholarship. Conventional ethnography uses participant observation where a researcher gains a close and intimate familiarity with a given group of individuals through intense involvement with people in their cultural environment, usually over an extended period of time and where the researcher keeps detailed and private records of their observations. This method can be pro probing and at times voyeuristic and therefore presents concerns for Indigenous researchers. 
and aim of this project is to transform the extractive nature of ethnography and participant observation by using more transparent, responsive and reciprocal ways of doing research. Our approach combines kaupapa, kaupapa tikanga and anthropological methods to understand the lived reality of harbour kaitiakitanga. Legal and anthropological analysis to investigate the way the legal system, including the codification of kaitiakitanga into law and policy, interacts with the practice of kaitiakitanga on the ground. And three, oral histories to investigate the ways flax roots activists from the 1980s onwards have understood the kaitiakitanga of harbours and how the politic has evolved. At the centre stage of this research design are the kaupapa and tikanga methods of hikoe wānanga, and these are just things that we kind of invented, um, you know, when you go and walk the land. So we're calling that a hikoe wānanga. It's experiencing the landscape through workshops. And we also have another one called noho wānanga, which is knowledge sharing workshops, where participants come together to discuss their understandings of harbours and kaitiakitanga. During Wānanga, participants will break out for individual or paired oral history interviews. Our oral history approach recognises that Māori are Aotearoa's first and foremost oral historians and follows Nipia Mahuika's argument that New Zealand oral histories are much more than simply sources to be heard but experiences to be had, found in multi-sensory interactions that open up oral history sources as sophisticated living forms. Our methods give emphasis to the lived experiences and understandings of participants, enabling us to co-create knowledge using a distinctively Māori lens. Our research is structured into four phases. Now the first phase, we've actually done it, was to get ethics approval from from this university. And then we also had to appoint a a kāhui, some people to guide us through the, the process. And what else did we have to do? We had to... Oh, because we've had so much time, because we've been <laughs> locked down, we've got a really great literature review <laughs> else to do. And we've been to the archives many times, and Kerry's very good at that. I have to take a lot of breaks. Favourite place. Yeah. I take a lot of breaks while we're in the archives. Nice coffee shop. <laughs> um, so, phase two of our research um, will be carried out at the harbours and will include... Pers- Participants from Ngāti Hikairo and Ngāti Mahuta, that's at Kāwhia, uh, Waikato Tainui, Te Waiohua, Te Kaurau, Amaki, Ngāti Whātua, that's at Manuko, Ngāpuhi, Ngāti Wai, Te Parapau and Patu Harakeke in the Whangarei Harbour. So those are all the groups that we want to work with and we have connections there. Um, these people whakapapa to our case study harbours. Now our engagement processes with potential participants will be responsive to their local social and political structures. Um, For example, Waikato Tainui representatives suggest that the pokai may be the opportunity to engage. Pokai are the annual series of visits by the Māori King to Kingi Tangamarae, where discussions of issues relevant to the iwi are debated, and there's a whole round of pokai around March, around COVID lockdown time. It's, we got we did make that week of rounds in Kafia, and so um, this is one way that we can engage with people by going to the pokai rounds. In Taitokiro, we have a different way of engaging. One of our researchers, Ngahuia, is well connected, and she's guiding us through that. And we also have another community researcher that lives in Takahiwai, and she's guiding us through that part. Data collection by the research team will be carried out during the Hikoe Wānanga and the Noho Wānanga, and we acknowledge the tapu of learning at um, the tapu of learning at these wānanga encourage the practice of karakia, the use of tikanga, uh, whaikore or whakafanaungatanga and waiata. So you have to be a drake of all trades. You have to know how to do everything: sing, pray, eat, cook. Um, it's quite a list of things that our researchers need to be able to do. Both kinds of wānanga require meticulous organisation and will involve extensive local travel by the research team around the North Island. Um, yeah. Each wānanga will cater for 12 participants and at least six researchers, ensuring an appropriate ratio for the data collection process over the course of the gathering. We will hold three hikoi wānanga in 2020 and three noho wānanga in 2021. Participants and the research team will stay overnight in a suitable accommodation, not in Morai, by the way, um, over a two-day period at Kafia, Manuko and Whangarei. 
Now, we have already con- conducted one hikoi waranga in Kafia, but Kiri couldn't come because it kind of happened and we didn't know it was happening. It just happened. <laughs> we arrived and then they did it all, took us around the place. And we have two more uh, noho waranga planned for November and uh, November in Kafia and one in Whangarei in December. Um, I won't talk too much more about hikoi waranga and noho waranga. If you want to know, um, just come and see me because I'm aware of the time. The third phase of our um, research methodology includes data analysis. And for those of you who are qualitative researchers, it's kind of like the same old thing, you know, looking for the themes, using in vivo, um, working together, the iteration between you about what you want to keep and what you want to um, put forward in your publications. So this side of the project is pretty traditional. We have to do that for the Royal Society, that is a requirement. But we also get to do some other things, some really good um, local dissemination things, some some new ways of disseminating and some new benefits and offerings to Māori communities. So we're going to Kafia um, at the end of November and we will host a noho, noho wānanga there but they are actually bringing in their own facilitator to facilitate. We are actually getting the food and everything done through the local school because we want to support the community as well. We won't be giving um, koha to them because they have an issue. They want to get a bylaw put through to stop people from using quad bikes and motorbikes on their their beachfront. And we happen to have a environmental lawyer and a governance specialist and a council councillor on our project team so we will be um, mm. offering them up to the community <laughs> and this <laughs> so this is a new type of research <laughs> benefits for Maoris okay um, and dissemination we have great ideas for dissemination um, because we need to report back to our communities. There would be no research without these communities, and um, we have a lot to offer back. But anyway, to conclude our talk today, um, in one of her dozens of letters and submissions, written in defence of the Manukau Harbour, Dame Nanikwa Minhinik stated, really are we, the Māori people, uh, recognised as having any worth, of having any values, of having any marine knowledge, conservation knowledge, or of making any real contribution to our country. Our project hears her call and is poised to gather the rich mātauranga that exists in our harbours and in our kaitiaki communities. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rakatu kakou. And this is what we want more of. <laughs> students. More students, <laughs> more students. good Māori students. <laughs> That's us.